So she didn't get a new one. So yeah. Same number? Yep. I'll send it to you then. Thank okay. you. All right. And it appears we at least got everybody on by audio and we could start with a roll call. Mayor Yeager or Mayor Yeager. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while it has been so sorry so yeah the mayor seaman is here <laughs> council member castellano here council member messner here that was funny <laughs> member arroyo here. council member allison i'm here council member Burgell. here all right and now if everybody would please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. And I do have the the flag. I also yeah. happen to be in my office, so I could just use the one in the background oh. if I wanted to. Either way. Okay. But I've got it right here. And all right. There we go. I'll do like in kindergarten. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Yeah. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. It never seems to get any uh, any better, but it's an effort. It's important to keep that on there. Um, do we have a report out from closed session, Mr. City Attorney? Yes, Madam Mayor. No actions were taken in closed session. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to Mayor's announcements. I just have a few things I wanted to mention tonight. One is um, tonight they are having a reception welcoming our second group of residents for St. Joseph's Hospital uh, and Open Door, the the joint effort to bring in family doctors to our community. It's a great program. If uh, we were not in city council, I would certainly like to be there welcoming them, welcoming them to the community. And I will certainly do that um, as I get an opportunity to meet them. It's a great program. This is the second year. Every year we bring residents in, that's an opportunity for us to have more family doctors in the area, which is crucial. Um, and so we're so grateful that that program is going on. And I wanted to mention that, yay, we're in the second year. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention was I talked a bit about some family child care grants that Humboldt Area Foundation and First Five put together to encourage, um, to support child care providers through this difficult time. And it's mostly about recovery and after COVID is over, making sure that our family child care providers are sustained in a way so that we have them as we begin the recovery process. So um, today, as of today, they have made 51 grants to child care providers um, who now have some additional financial support um, where they might not have, have um, kids paying or parents paying for their kids to be there it's to allow them to stay in the profession so when we when it comes time for us to start recovery people can go to work um, the third thing I wanted to talk about is I have been working with the um, and actually I should say this is through my other for through my job at AEDC um, working with the governor's office uh, small business to gather and distribute PPE equipment that's going to be shared with small businesses throughout Humboldt County, including Eureka. Um, we're gonna have 400,000 masks to distribute and almost three, uh, about 2,800 gallons of hand sanitizer. We're gonna have a big distribution day uh, throughout, the county, or throughout the county next Wednesday Eureka's is going to be from nine to four at the Bayshore Mall, and any business can come and get uh, free supplies for their staff. And I'm very, very excited about that. I also do want to thank the city of Eureka for uh, allowing us to store that equipment. Uh, it sounded like a reasonable amount until you saw an airport hangar that was completely full 
and actually had to start moving it out. And so um, I want to thank uh, city manager and our facilities manager for being awesome and helping me out and making sure that those businesses are going to get all of those uh, that equipment as it's needed. And that is my report. So after that, we will move on to public comment period. Uh, do we have any public comment? Mayor, Mayor, we do not have any public comment for open public comment that has uh, requested that I call them, but we do have a number of um, folks that are on our Zoom call now. I don't know if any of them would like to speak under general public comment or if they're here for a particular item. Um, so do, do we have a way for them to unmute themselves if they are here for public comment? If you're here for public comment, just uh, try to uh, unmute yourself and start talking and hopefully it won't be more than one person at one time. And this is for non-agenda items, yeah, right? Just, just to clarify. Yes. And it sounds like everybody here might be here for a specific reason. So I will close out public comment um, and we will move on to the consent calendar because we don't have any public hearings today. I do know we're gonna pull item B3 from the consent calendar, but can I have a, an approval um, with that? I move approval of the consent calendar minus item B3. I, I second that. All right, uh, roll call vote, please. Council member Castellano. Aye. Council member Mesner. Aye. Council member Arroyo. Aye. Council member Allison. Yes. Council member Bergell. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, vote. Motion carries. All right. And so now we're going to look at item B3, which is a letter of support to the Humboldt County Planning Commission um, for their uh, decision on the billboards. And I uh, first we'll ask questions. Do we have anybody here to make a, a presentation about the letter? Or we can we just ask questions first? I can make a brief presentation about how the letter came about. That would be lovely. Thank you, Director or uh, City Manager Slattery. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and council members. Uh, this letter here was uh, came out of a meeting that staff was having with uh, one of our council members uh, with some nonprofits. Um, at the end of that meeting, um, there was a request to see if our council would support um, writing a letter to the Board of Supervisors to support the Humboldt County Planning Commission's decision to not allow a uh, reinstallation of a billboard that was damaged during a storm last year. Um, the Planning Commission uh, determined that it uh, did not meet the current zoning codes um, associated with the area, and also that it potentially could be a public safety issue. The location of it is to the south of Eureka, outside of Eureka city limits. Um, it's on the entryway that comes in from the south up to the, to the north through town. And so uh, the council member wanted this to be on the agenda to see if uh, there was support to submit this to the Board of Supervisors. And so um, that's where we got with today and um, it's up for the council's consideration. Thank you very much. So did we, anybody from council have any questions about this? Seeing none. Um, oh, I do. Question? Surprise. Or a question, right? Okay. Yes. Go ahead. I'll just, I, it took me a second to unmute myself. Okay. Um, so do we, um, do, um, what is my question? Um, I'm trying to put my, my thoughts into a, a coherent format. Um, I I don't know of an example where we have um, done this in the past. Does staff know of any examples where we have sent letters to the County Planning Commission or to the county to 
make a similar type of request? Um, I'm not, I couldn't give you specifics, but I, I'm, I, I'm sure that we have um, put in either a letter of support or um, opinion. I mean, obviously we've done letters of support for grants and those types of things that they may be going after or other types of programming. But, you know, council has in the past, uh, I believe it was the, the gas pipeline in, in the Dakotas that there was a submit a, a letter of support for that. Specific to the planning commission, it, it, I mean, specific to the board of supervisors, exactly like this. I'm not aware of a specific case, but uh, council has sent letters to the county, either encouraging legislation or encouraging uh, support of a grant or, or those types of things. Okay, yeah, I was just not sure if we have, um, at least in my memory, I couldn't remember us doing something in this kind of context. I can remember grant support and then items like um, support for projects that we serve on the Drake Powers Authority uh, for that kind of thing. Um, but I, I just wondered if staff had any examples of similar actions that we've taken. But uh, I think that's it, that's all I have. All right. Any other questions? I know we have some public comment on this. All right, uh, City Clerk Powell, do we have a phone call okay. comments? Um, yes, I have a phone call to make. And then Mr. Wills, Jeff Wills is also on the Zoom call, but he asked me to call him too. But I'm gonna start with a Mr. Jeff Slack and I'll be making that call now. Why, okay. Okay, do you wanna? I was wondering if we should ask Mr. Wills if he wants to talk while you're making that call. Perfect. Or have him hold. Uh, he looks like he's unmuted himself. So we yeah, I'll let Jeff Black go first. Go. But since I was able to join, you don't have to call me. I can just talk here. Okay. But we'll let uh, my attorney Jeff Slack speak first. Oh, okay. So then we'll wait for him. Hi, Jeff. Uh, I um, am starting the timer now. When you're ready to speak, please go ahead. I'm available. Hold on one second. They're having a little trouble here. Okay. Sorry. I'm going to. Um... All right. Uh, see. Please go ahead now. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, council members, for allowing me to make public comment on this issue. Um, I'll, I'll keep my, my statements brief, but um, I, I really strongly believe at this time it would be inappropriate for the city to comment on this billboard issue. Uh, this billboard is not within the city's jurisdiction. Um, however, the business the city is, would be advocating against for spending this letter is one of its own. It's the only licensed billboard company that's based in the city of Eureka. For the city to write such a letter um, clearly advocating one position over another would be highly prejudicial to a business that pays taxes, employs people in the city, and is, is generally a law-abiding um, business within the city. Uh, the letter itself is a little misleading. This is a legal non-conforming structure, and that's the issue before the, uh, the Board of Supervisors. Um, the letter references that the proposed development is not consistent with the existing zone in which the site is located. Well, that would be true for uh, new construction as a legal non-conforming structure. The county code allows this. Um, Again, the, the issues raise public safety. Again, this is outside the city limits. Um, and the county has ordinances that the project would be conditioned on complying with um, that addresses those public safety issues. Um, and so, you know, at this time, <clears throat> it would be inappropriate to comment that until the county process plays out. Um, again, I just want to reiterate this is a legal non conforming structure, um, and we're not advocating that it could be built today but we're just urging the board to follow county code um i, I want to echo council member arroyo's comments um you know I, I i've never heard of the city taking a position against one of its own businesses <clears throat> before a board of supervisors 
I understand if the city was advocating for grant money or something like that, but in this case, it's, it's advocating over one of its own businesses to a, a separate jurisdiction. And, and I just, I, I don't know what precedent that would set for um, the city moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. And now, um, Mr. Wills, would you like to speak? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, just like Jeff's comments, I'm, I just found out about this this morning and I'm absolutely blown away that the city of Eureka would advocate or find any position on anything that is out of their jurisdiction against one of their own businesses, my own business. Um, especially again, like Jeff said, this is not a new development. I have, I don't know if any of you have read the staff report. This is why I took this appeal to the board of supervisors. The Humboldt County staff did a very, very detailed, I think it's a 35 page report and I have a hundred percent recommendation for approval of my project. It is allowed within the zoning and it is under a non-conforming sign allowed per Humboldt County code. So for the city of Eureka to take a stance on this, it just, I, I've, it puts a really, really bad taste in my mouth um, for our council members to do this against me and my business. Mm. So that's my thoughts on it. Um, I do would, would like to thank you guys though for uh, on such short notice, pulling this from the consent item and giving us a chance to comment on it. Um, yeah, I think I got replies from you guys within a couple of minutes. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have anybody else here to speak on this item? Um, see none, then I will uh, go ahead and bring it back for comments. Does anybody on the board or council have council member Messner? Yeah, I, I actually did have some concerns about this and, and the same reasons that have been brought up. Um, it is someone within our own city, it, yet the sign is outside of our jurisdiction. So we would be in, in a sense, um, having county and city come against a constituent, you know, um, in a business within the community um, that we've worked with uh, for many years. I, I, um, it just concerned me how many, how much do we do that? And, and how often are, do we say that that's something that we shouldn't do? Um, we don't want to, it, it is the United States of America, we the people, you know, and it's for the people um, and not government taking over. So. I, I just had some concerns about this particular item um, and it isn't a decision that we are making. Um, it is something that the supervisors will need to figure out, but um, I definitely uh, am concerned about keeping this item specifically in the way that it is um, focused um, as a letter against one of our own businesses. So I had some concerns about this and, and did pull it. All right. Thank you, member. Or thank you, Council Member Mesner, Council Member Roy Arroyo. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thanks, public commenters. Um, I I also share some concerns about this item. And it uh, as an individual who has my own likes and preferences, I would prefer to see fewer billboards, but that isn't really what we're deciding here. Um, I I think that you know, we, we don't have much of a history in my recollection, and sometimes I forget <laughs> things, but we don't have much of a history of petitioning the county to make specific decisions um, that are in county jurisdiction that don't, have, that, that don't take place in city limits or pertain to a board that we serve on, something like that. Um, the last time I remember us doing that, it was in favor of the, um, the wind project. Um, and it was brought because we have a council member who sits on the RCEA board, um, but it was way before we had information about that project. 
Um, and I later felt uncomfortable with the fact that we had sent a letter. Um, you know, I, I think we couldn't have known that, that uh, a lot of things about it at the time, but that's exactly why um, I, I would prefer to really be making decisions that are supporting, either supporting grant um, letters of support that are for projects that benefit the city of Eureka directly or take place in city limits or, um, you know, or really within city limits. Um, I would rather we make decisions or urge decisions that um, are within city limits. Um, I think doing other than that might open up a Pandora's box of challenges that I, I'm not sure that I want to uh, to deal with, you know, if we're asked to petition the county on all manner of things that are outside of our our decision making authority, um, I, that's just um, a challenging situation. And also, I don't know that it really helps with our relationship building with the county supervisors if um, we are constantly advocating for them to make. Um, decisions using, you know, the full kind of breadth of our authority to, um, you know, to write formalized letters. Now, I do think we have every right to contact county supervisors and um, tell them our thoughts and opinions on, on matters that pertain to the city of Eureka. Um, but in this case, I just would prefer that we not get into writing letters like this. Um, it doesn't really have to do with the merits of the project or um, any effort to kind of sway the, um, yeah, I, I just would rather we not go there personally. Do we have any other comments? Council Member Messner? I mean, uh, Castellana, sorry. <laughs> it's the, the evening of mixed up names. Um, <laughs> I, let's see, I definitely, understand uh, council member Messner and council member Arroyo's concerns. Um, I do serve as a member of organizations that um, have contacted me with concerns about the billboard. Um, and so, you know, for that reason, um, I do feel that though it's not within Eureka proper, it, it does affect um, things that we are, you know, and, and as a member of these organizations that I'm seriously working on um, uh, to, to advocate for beautification and, you know, and really looking at that southern entrance to Eureka, you know, um, this, the letter does not mention a business at all. And I definitely I'm not opposed to, you know, that business's well-being in our community, but I do, um, you know, I, I do feel a responsibility to con continue to advocate for um, improvements that, you know, affect our whole community. Councilmember Bergell. Relying on our city manager here. <laughs> I would say that um, in hearing both sides, I have already personally reached out to my supervisor and given my opinion. Um, and I, I really, um, I don't know if this is the, the, the thing that I, uh, I don't know. I just feel like I don't know what I'm gonna say. I feel like that I, really as a personal opinion don't really I don't really care for billboards at all I think that they're unattractive and they um, they are a distraction when driving um, sometimes they can be okay but as a city I think that um, it might be better to advocate on a personal level as opposed to a city level and I've already done that um, everybody is welcome to do that uh, whatever your advocation might be so um, I'll just leave it there. Council member Allison. Um, you know, it's like, I, I know the owner said, this seems like a shock that the city would be doing this, but uh, to, to flip the coin on the other side, there's many constituents that I've 
received correspondence from asking that we make this push and move to um, give an opinion to, to the supervisors about this. So um, in hearing both sides, perhaps, um, you know, the city of Eureka doesn't have to take take a personal stance, but perhaps we as council members can just write a letter giving our personal opinion to our supervisor. If that's some sort of compromise where we don't uh, have an official stance, but yet we as council members can take a stance because everyone has opinions about things, especially if it has to do with uh, aesthetics, which is a highly subjective topic. Um, like, you know, why there's an agenda item about this. So maybe, um, you know, I don't know if I'm making a motion here, but we can sort of, I can move that we dismiss this letter and instead take it up as council members to to give our opinion to the supervisors if that's a satisfactory motion for other council members well we'll see if we have a second do we have a second on that particular motion can is that you kim saying yes is that i believe kim uh, council member Brigel has made a second i'm relying on our city manager i apologize yeah i'll second that <laughs> So we have a motion, we have a second. Do we have any further discussion on the motion? Uh, Council Member Messner. Uh, so um, I've already talked with the supervisors, so I'm not sure if this um, motion is requiring each one of the council members to write a letter to each of the supervisors, because that's kind of what it sounds like to me, which is a little bit... Um, odd actually i think optional um, oh okay yeah <laughs> okay i just was um you know because i'd encourage the public if if they have opinions about you know these things to reach out to the supervisors because they are the ones that are making the decision so i think that's a really important thing to just encourage people to to do that um and remind people of that you know if they contact us that you know that that's something they can do um and I, I agree that I don't think we should do it as a city um, for a lot of the reasons that have come up. So um, thank you for that, council member. Um, Austin, Allison, thank you. <laughs> I always just wanna call you. So <laughs> council member Allison um, and, and uh, for what, what you guys have spoken. Um, yeah, so that was just my thoughts. <laughs> I see council member Castellano would like to speak again. It has a comment. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't need to oppose the dismissal of the letter, but um, <laughs> I do. You know, and I understand the problematics, and I also um, think that um, you know it, it, it. You know, I I, I do want to you know build a community you know based on mutual respect, and that um, it's. I think it's okay for council to take stances on um, things that affect like the beautification efforts we're, we're making as a city. Um, so I'll continue to do my work uh, in other arenas for now. Um, thanks. Okay, well, we have a motion in a second. So let's make this official then. And would you mind calling for a vote, City Clerk Powell? Councilmember Castellano? Aye. Councilmember Messner? Aye. Councilmember Arroyo? Aye. Councilmember Allison? Yes. And Councilmember Burgell? Aye. Unanimous yes vote. Motion carries. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for um, participating for those who called in and who are watching and who are interested. I know there's a lot of. Um, a lot of really passionate people on this issue so uh, and it makes a difference it really does even even if this letter didn't get written uh, people are talking about it and they're hearing about it and i'm sure council is all thinking about it um strongly so thank you and that then puts our consent calendar to bed and we are going to move on to item c1 which is ordinances and resolutions and this one is going to be presented by Director Gerby. Good evening, Mayor Council. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, 
while I'm presenting this item, I, I want to point out that uh, all the preparation of, uh, you know, years of preparation really that have gone into the recommendation that's before you tonight uh, has really been a team effort. Uh, the city manager, the, the assistant city manager, uh, Director Millar, uh, all of us have been heavily involved recently and, and I, in thinking about this presentation tonight, I realized that uh, the preparation for it really dates back to uh, 2015 and uh, deciding what would be needed in order to um, replace Measure Q, uh, you know, after when voters enacted it. And uh, so all of that's culminated in what we're talking about tonight. And uh, just a second, I will share my screen and get to the presentation. Okay, Madam Mayor, can you see my presentation here? I can indeed. Thank you. Great. Okay, so what we're talking about this evening is the Supplemental Transaction and Use Tax or STUT ballot measure. Uh, we do not have a measure identifier yet, uh, but if the council moves forward with this one, then we'll have that uh, information before too long here. Now I just need to figure out why it's not, there we go, why it's not advancing. Just a little bit of background. Um, where do the revenues for the general fund come from? You've seen a lot uh, this year about the revenue and expenditure situation that we're facing in the general fund, as well as all the other city funds. But for the general fund in particular, uh, the majority of it, 78% comes from taxes with about 58% coming, coming from sales tax. And that sales tax, 58%, uh, is made up of three components. There's the 1% from ba Bradley Burns, the quarter cent from Measure D, and the half cent from Measure Q, which is really what we're focusing on tonight. Uh, the discussion of what to do with Measure Q going away and uh, how best to move forward to ensure the financial security of the city. What is Measure Q? Uh, it was enacted by voters in 2014, and what it did was extend the half cent sales tax that was initiated with Measure O back in 2010, which was a five-year measure. Um, measure Q is also a five-year measure. Uh, it received a yes vote back in 2014 of 66.61%. Uh, interestingly, just shy of the, of the super majority that would have been required if it had been a specific tax, you'll recall that in 2018, uh, the city put forward measure I, which was a transportation specific, specific tax. And uh, that one uh, generated a yes vote of about 64 and a quarter percent. So uh, under the threshold of the two thirds plus one that was required for a, for a specific tax. However, uh, Measure Q, as was Measure O, uh, was a general purpose tax measure and required only a 50% plus one uh, majority. And in fiscal year 1819, uh, Measure Q generated approximately $4.4 million of revenue for the city's general fund. Looking at how those funds are used, it's really in the same manner as other general fund revenues. And looking back to the language that was in the ballot question for Measure Q and Measure O before it, uh, it was intended to fund essential services such as police, fire and medical response, street maintenance, environmental programs, the zoo, parks and recreation. And uh, it has every year since the inception of Measure O and Measure Q following it been subject to oversight by the Finance Advisory Committee as the citizens uh, oversight panel that was discussed and contemplated in the measure. And every year the Finance Advisory Committee has found that the funds from Measures O and Measure Q have been used in manners consistent with um, what was promised to voters. Why does the city need to act now? As I mentioned, Measure O was a five-year measure and Measure Q uh, was a five-year measure as well. So it's currently set to expire on June 30th, 21, 2021, um, meaning that the last chance for the city to act in a, in a general November election is, uh, is this November. We're also uh, 
definitely facing declining general fund revenues. As I mentioned, the council has seen a lot of information about that in the past year uh, and certainly in the past couple of months. We know that these declining revenues were present before COVID-19 and even more so after COVID-19. Uh, when we talk about uh, the deficit that the general fund was facing going into the fiscal year, it was a, a $1.8 million deficit, which increased to $2.3 million at mid-year budget. And that has since gone to uh, over $5 million of a deficit in the general fund. So something needs to be done to provide a secure source of local revenue to make sure that uh, the city has the funds that it needs to continue providing those essential services. And as we found, uh, despite lots of discussion, there has not yet been anything uh, in the way of substantive um, assistance from the state or federal government, aside from some of the, uh, the COVID-19 relief money uh, that's you know, less than $500,000 in total. Before coming to council with a recommendation or developing the measure for council's consideration, staff worked with uh, a few different firms on doing some research as to what the electorate wants, what are voters looking for from the city. And we've used the same survey firm, EMC Research, um, three times now, once in 2018 for um, the research ahead of measure I, the transportation specific sales tax, once in the fall of last year, looking at what the city might do this year. And then once uh, in late April to early May of this year, there was a, a hybrid live telephone and email to web survey of likely November 2020 voters. And there were 304 interviews uh, conducted, which resulted in an overall margin of error of about 5.6 percentage points. Um, one might think that this is a, a too small a number to really survey the electorate of Eureka, but when we look at the number of registered voters and the number of likely voters in November 2020, um, according to the experts that we worked with at EMC Research, this was really the highest number that they thought was achievable given uh, all of those circumstances. So yeah, we did poll in 2019 about a sales tax measure like what we're discussing tonight, but understanding that the financial picture for the city has changed and understanding the financial picture for a lot of our voters and our residents has changed, we thought that it would be wise to do another round of survey work to see if uh, the COVID-19 pandemic had a significant impact on, on what the voters thought about uh, the city's finances and what to do about it. The key findings from all that survey work uh, were that the support for a general purpose local revenue measure, like what we're discussing, is currently well above the 50% plus one threshold. Uh, a majority of respondents think that the city is going in the right direction, which quite frankly is a change from the two previous rounds of polling. Uh, in 2018, we saw that a majority of people thought that the city was on the wrong track. In 2019, the picture was better and it was about an even split between those that thought we were on the right track or in the or on the wrong one. And then fast forward now to a late April, early May of 2020, and the majority of respondents now believe that the city is going in the right direction. Uh, the majority of respondents also approve of the job the city is doing to respond to COVID-19 and they recognize the need for local funding for local services. Kind of what I talked about before, we know that the state and the federal government are not going to come to the rescue. And they didn't just recognize it, they really did recognize overwhelmingly the city's need for additional funding. On the left, you see the picture from the fall of 2019, and on the right, you see the picture from uh, spring of 2020. Look at that column where 83% of respondents see a need, either, a, either some need or a great need for uh, additional funding, local funding for local services to serve our residents. And a majority actually see a great need for that funding. And very few people believe that the city has no need for additional funding to provide the essential services that we're tasked with providing. 
So when we talk about the educational effort surrounding a ballot measure, this is one of the things that's important because if we had to educate voters as to the need for the funding and then also tell them everything else about the ballot measure, the, the implications of voting for it, the implications of voting against it, how the funds would be used and how the revenues are generated, we would have a much uh, steeper climb to get there. But because respondents recognize the need for funding, that doesn't have to be part of the educational effort. Respondents were asked um, what the priorities should be for um, using the funding that would be generated from a measure like this. And so there was a list of services that the city provides and respondents were asked if they strongly support, somewhat support on down the line, the use of funds from a measure like this uh, for those services. And you'll see here that across the board, uh, a, a majority of respondents strongly supported every single item on the list. Um, when you get to the total support number there, the third column from the right hand side, you see that 97% of people support using funds from a local revenue measure to repair potholes, 95% to maintain youth and senior services, 97% to support local businesses and maintain local jobs. Then we get to the crux of the issue. And I'll, I'll read the question specifically at a later portion of the presentation, but do voters support what we're talking about tonight, which is a one and one and a quarter cent sales tax to uh, support local services and fund uh, those services that the city provides. 74% of respondents said yes, and 24% said no. So as I mentioned, as a general purpose sales tax measure, this would be required to get a 50% plus one majority to pass. And what we see here at, is that respondents by an overwhelming majority uh, support this type of measure. What does the measure itself mean, this STUT? First, what would it do? It would extend the existing voter approved sales tax of measure Q at a one and a quarter cent rate until ended by voters to pay for necessary services, including police, fire, community services, and street maintenance. Um, we should note that all of the financial forecasts that you've seen with the budget adoption this year and going forward, some of the, the COVID-19 related information that Director Millar presented showing just how long it's going to take to recover from the fiscal emergency that we're in, um, which is really beyond our ability to forecast at this point. All of those financial forecasts are based on a one cent rate. And the reason that staff has done that is because by preparing a one and a quarter cent measure, we can basically hold that quarter percent, um, I won't say in reserves because it's not in reserves in reality, but we can use it for other purposes that we aren't yet contemplated contemplating. We can generate significant revenue for street maintenance, uh, over a million and a half dollars annually, which far exceeds our existing budget. It would well more than double it, even including the funding from uh, the RMRA. And we can, in the long run, save signif significant taxpayer dollars by paying down our PERS underfunded liability in 15 years instead of 30. When we look at what the general fund revenues with the measure would look like. Um, in the three bars on the left, you see the existing revenues that have declined uh, somewhat significantly um, made up of those three components of sales tax that I was talking about. The Bradley Burns at 1%, Measure D at one quarter, and Measure Q at one half. In this graph, uh, the STUT is represented as Measure X, and uh, you see a 1% in the sort of gold color and uh, the additional streets funding of 1.5 million in blue. And this may look like we've got a significant jump in funding. There would be all this money to spend. But first off, remember what I said at the beginning, that we're operating the general fund at a significant deficit 
this year, over $5 million. So when you look at the funding without the additional funds that would be allocated to street maintenance, we're basically getting back to even and then slowly building revenues from there and keeping in mind that expenditures are also rising because of costs that are out of our control. That additional street maintenance funding is there at the top of the bars. And like I said, that 1.5 million would well is would more than double our existing street maintenance funding. So here's the ballot question. This is the critical thing. The city has 75 words to ask voters uh, you know, on the ballot what we should do. And I'm going to read it so that people who don't have the presentation in front of them can hear it. Um, and here it goes. To maintain police, fire, 911 emergency medical response, disaster preparedness, street road maintenance, pothole repair, parks, recreation, youth and senior services, homelessness and drug prevention programs and other essential services shall an ordinance renewing the city of Eureka's voter approved sales tax at the 1.25 cent rate be adopted until ended by voters providing an estimated $9.6 million annually with independent citizen oversight, annual audits and all funds spent to benefit local residents and as I mentioned, that was the question that respondents were, um, were asked during the survey and 74% of them said that, yes, they could support that measure. What are we asking the council to do tonight? Uh, there are resolutions that, uh, that call for an election, placing the STUT extension on the November ballot and consolidating the election, requesting election services from the Humboldt County Elections Office providing a procedure for the submittal of ballot arguments and rebuttals and directing the city attorney to author an impartial analysis. The state law requires the council to adopt a resolution that identifies the language of the ballot question and requests that the Board of Supervisors authorize the elections office to place the ordinance on the ballot. That resolution is attached to the agenda item. Uh, there are multiple resolutions actually, and they comply with these state requirements. And the resol there's a resolution also that directs the city attorney to pre prepare an impartial analysis of no more than 500 words showing the effect of the measure on existing law. When it comes to ballot arguments and rebuttal arguments, uh, arguments for and against the measure uh, have to be no more than 300 words and they must be submitted to the city clerk by 5 p.m. on August 4th, 2020. Rebuttal arguments of no more than 250 words each must be submitted no later than 10 days after. And of course, if there's no argument in opposition, then there won't be a rebuttal to that argument. Uh, the city council or members of the city council are given priority if they submit an argument related to the ballot measure. And staff uh, has put forward the resolution that authorizes the mayor to coordinate with other community members to submit the argument for the STUT and any rebuttal if necessary. So with that, you've got staff's recommendation here in front of you. It's in the agenda summary as well. I'll probably stop sharing my screen so that you can, um, you'll have to refer to that agenda summary. And of course, if you want me to pop this back up, I can do so. Whoever uh, reads this, uh, I think gets a gold star because it's probably one of the longer recommendations we've had in quite some time. And um, with that, I'll stop sharing. And if you've got questions, which I'm sure you do, I can try to answer some. And the whole team that I talked about is here and available for uh, portions that I'm not as familiar with. All right, it looks like council member Allison's super excited to ask a question. <laughs> I have two questions. Uh, First one, um, I want to talk about things that are taxable. So if I'm aware uh, correctly, like things like groceries are not taxable, like food items from, you know, Safeway, Costco, things like that. Right, there there are exemptions listed in ordinance. Um, correct, we don't pay tax on food at the grocery store, for instance. We do when we go out to eat at a restaurant, um, you know, just to be, completely transparent about it. Uh, prescription drugs are not. The, the question often comes up about vehicles and would this measure have a negative impact on car dealers in Eureka, for instance? 
and vehicles uh, are taxed based on the zip code where they are registered. So uh, anyone who lives in Eureka but buys a car in the city limits, outside the city limits, out of the area, uh, those would all be taxed based on uh, the tax rate in the city of Eureka. Thank you. And um, my second question for now is, um, this is more like a rhetorical for Eureka residents, but um, how many people come to the city every day, if you have an estimate, who uh, shop, work, and play here, who might contribute to our economy, but not necessarily live in city limits? And if that would be a, a big impact for the city of Eureka to have a tax measure like this. Absolutely. Um, we have estimated the number before as to what percentage of the sales tax in Eureka comes from residents outside the city limits. And that estimate is 50%. We are, as part of the educational effort for this measure, planning on nailing that number down a little more firmly. But certainly as the center of commerce and of government in the county, we know that people come into Eureka to do business, to shop, to, you know, transact with government agencies. And when they're here, they're using city services. That's an impact on our police department and Humboldt Bay Fire. It's, they have an impact on our streets. And so it's reasonable that um, they should help to cover the cost of the services that the city needs to provide. And a sales tax is a way of accomplishing that because when people come here to shop, they contribute. That wouldn't be the true of a parcel tax, for instance, where we would be asking just property owners to pay for the impacts of people coming from outside the city. Thank you. Council Member Messner. Thank you so much, Director Gerving, for um, speaking to this. I had a, just a couple questions. When, when we have people who have concerns, I've heard the most concerns about two items. So I would love for you to speak to both of those. And one is the sunset or the lack thereof on this particular item. And then the second is the one and a quarter cent, um, you know, that, that high number seemingly. Um, and what I heard you say is that really it's only three quarters of a cent, right? Because um, it's making up for that other half cent um, from the past. So it's really three quarters of a percent um, increase. But could you speak to why, uh, why that amount was chosen and what, um, and what that's for? Like if there's anything you wanted to address regarding those two items. Sure, I'll cover the second question first and, uh, and then get to the, the former. So the, you're correct with uh, this measure extending the existing half cent sales tax, but at a one and a quarter cent rate, we're looking at a net increase of three quarters of a percent. And that increase, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in our budget planning and financial forecasting, all of that was done with a, an overall tax associated with a measure like this of 1%. And what we found is that it will take us quite some time to get through this fiscal emergency, even with that 1% of funding. It's not like the city would be swimming in cash or, or able to pay for a bunch of new services. Just to build back to reasonable reserves will really take quite some time. And then that additional quarter cent that we've excluded from the financial forecasts is kind of held sacred for the time being to be able to fund additional street maintenance, which we know is a huge priority. Look at that, the chart that I showed with 97% of people thinking that that's a, a valuable use for funding from a measure like this. So being able to allocate, you know, in the neighborhood, in many years, more than $1.5 million worth of funding to street maintenance would be uh, something that the voters would appreciate in the city of Eureka. And being able to pay down that uh, PERS unfunded liability more quickly and in the long run, saving taxpayers a lot of money by doing that. And 
we have to really stress that the PERS unfund, unfunded liability is not something that the city can get out of. We don't have a choice about it. We can't just cancel our contract with PERS or start giving people 401ks instead of PERS. That's not an option that we have unless we want to pay an exorbitant amount of money. Uh, that's a figure I don't have in front of me, but it's far more money than the city can ever think of paying to get out of a contract like that. So the best that we can hope for is to be more fiscally prudent and pay it down more quickly. Think of refinancing a mortgage into a 15 year term instead of a 30 year term. And it has the same effect in the long run, you save money. And in the out years, you have additional funding that's not being allocated to that purpose that can be used for other needs. Getting back to the earlier question about the term of the measure, you're correct. There's no finite term here. Um, both measure O and measure Q did have finite terms of five years. This one, uh, we look at a little bit differently. First, we do not see in the, in the long term, there's no foreseeable time when there won't be a need for this funding. The fiscal picture for cities has changed fundamentally. And so we're seeing more and more cities have to develop, having to develop measures like this to make sure that they have secure local funding. Um, the voters support it. You see that 74% of people supported with the wording that's in the measure until ended by voters, they supported that idea. And finally, really what it's doing is it's empowering those voters rather than having a finite term of some arbitrary length, say it's 20 years, instead, Voters really have the power every two years to initiate that process. The council in the future has the opportunity every two years to initiate a process to put it back before the voters. And if people think that the, the funds are no longer necessary or they think that they're not being spent as they were promised, then they can let the voters decide uh, whether it should continue. Thank you. Council Member Arroyo. Could you um, clarify a little bit more about the Financial um, Oversight Committee and what, what that looks like, um, how they meet, who, how they're appointed, et cetera? Sure. So the Finance Advisory Committee serves as the oversight panel for what was originally Measure O and is now Measure Q. And annually, they review um, the way that those funds have been spent and ensure that they're being spent in a manner consistent with what was promised to voters. Um, if Director Millar wants to chime in on it, exactly how those interactions go and what the meetings are like, he, he's welcome to. Uh, but just as they review uh, proposed fees and the proposed budget uh, before the council does, uh, they also review, uh, they serve as an oversight body for Measure Q and, and would for this STUT as well. And as I mentioned, every year they found that the measure O and Q funds have been spent in a manner consistent with what was promised to voters. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I have two very small ones. Um, they're just like one word questions too. Um, I didn't catch what, it's like 76% of our general fund comes from taxes and 58% or 50 something percent of that. Was that 50 some percent of the 76 percent or 58 percent of the whole general tax? Does that make sense? It does make sense. Okay. So no, 58 percent of the general fund comes from sales tax and another 20 percent comes from other taxes, okay. property tax and, and transient occupancy tax. That's what that's what made sense to me, but I just wanted to clarify. And the other one is I just want to clarify it start this would start July 2021 after the sunset of the last one. That's correct. It would pick up immediately after measure Q ends. There wouldn't be an overlap or anything like that. Perfect. Council member Arroyo. Thanks. I was wondering, uh, I know I don't want you to have to get into like all the nitty gritty of this, but in broad strokes, could you speak to what kinds of revenue sources have declined? I mean, I, I often hear people saying, you know, well, 20, 30 years ago, it seemed like we didn't always have such a tight budget and that there was more money for roads or more money for um, a lot of these services that we provide. Could you speak to kind of why the picture has changed? 
I, I don't know that I'm the best person to, uh, to really give a good answer on that. Thank you for putting me on the spot. But um, if Director Millar is still in room 207 and he's able to chime in, uh, please do so. Um, I, don't, I think that would be a very long conversation to have right now, but I can come back and um, I think there is research out there about why sales tax uh, just hasn't kept up with uh, your expenses. If you look at uh, cities around California, so. I was thinking specifically of like road taxes or gas taxes and some of the um, some of the funding sources around uh, transportation infrastructure in, in particular. I know that those have changed and some of it has to do with vehicle efficiency and driver behavior and things like that. Um, that's what I had in mind, but I... I can't speak towards the gas tax. So the problem okay. with the gas tax is that they did it as a fixed amount so you know over time things get more expensive but they decided to put it at you know 18 cents or 15 cents so if you do that then it doesn't keep up with inflation and then the other uh reason why gas tax doesn't keep up with our road needs is that you do have improvements in vehicle um, or the mileage um on cars has improved a lot and you know when you're getting 50 miles to the gallon, you're paying less in taxes. So right. those are the, the two main reasons why our gas tax revenue streams do not keep up with the maintenance needs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'd be interested in, in hearing kind of at some point why the sales tax picture had changed, but that's what I was thinking of in particular. Sorry for putting you both on the spot. Council member Bergel, did I, yes, I did see your hand. Well, I was just hopeful that you could clarify. I get a lot of calls about the roads. I'm sure that we all do. So can you talk a little bit about what the picture will look like when this, ta when this tax is passed as far as um, how quickly road repairs will be happening, um, how that will be delineated, how that will be set up, um, that type of thing. Um, because I've gotten some calls about major was it Q or O where that was kind of at the bottom of the, of the, you know, you had the police, fire, and then you had like road repair and parks kind of at the bottom and there wasn't a lot of money that went there. So I'm curious, um, yeah, if you could just clarify that. Sure, well, first I, I can assure you that uh, I know that the council gets lots of emails and phone calls about roads and uh, the director of public works does too. So we're all <laughs> there. We all have the same concerns about the condition of our streets. And I can also assure you that uh, there was no attempt to mislead the voters or to um, you know, spend the money in a way that uh, we weren't promising. But the fact of the matter is that costs across the board have increased so significantly beyond the revenues that were generated by measures O and Q that there really hasn't been any capacity to to allocate additional general fund dollars to street maintenance we were thankfully uh you know we were lucky enough to receive additional money from the state from sb1 in the rmra or road maintenance and rehabilitation account uh, after 2017 that has improved our revenue picture for street maintenance before that, we were able to spend about a hundred eighty to two hundred thousand dollars a year on street maintenance from gas tax funds. Now we're seeing uh, additional RMRA revenues in about the half million dollar range, and so it's absolutely uh, expanded our capacity to execute projects like that. But it's nowhere near what we need. If you'll recall from some of the uh, presentations that the council has seen before about pavement condition index and things like that, the estimated number that we need to just kind of maintain our existing average street condition, you're looking at $2.8 million annually, which is obviously way outside the ballpark of what we can accommodate. With uh, the extra quarter cent from this measure uh, that we could allocate largely to street maintenance. As I said, we, we could look at a, an additional 1.5 million. So you look at the picture from 
2017 and prior with $200,000 a year and you add the 1.5 million from this measure and the half million or so from RMRA, and you're looking at 10 times the street budget that we had uh, before all of this. So ten, that means 10 times the paving work. And, and in reality, when you get to larger projects like that, you can achieve some cost efficiencies that allow you to do more than 10 times the work with 10 times the funding. So as to how those funds would be allocated, which streets would come first, you know, what types of projects would we do? We would really need to analyze that as time goes on. But I can tell you that some of the streets that we have had no capacity to, to make any headway with because they're so far degraded that they would require complete con reconstruction. You know, that hasn't been an option because we haven't had the funds. And if you're talking about one block of Second Street in the Bridge District, for instance, might cost $180,000 to rehabilitate. And prior to 2018, that was our entire streets budget for the year. So could we responsibly use all of our paving budget for one block? No, we couldn't. We had to allocate those dollars to the more highly traveled streets uh, where we could get the most done uh, cost effectively. And we've been able to, you know, divert some of those funds more recently to um, areas where we probably couldn't have previously, but we're still really having to focus on arterials and collectors, those streets that are more highly traveled. Uh, in the future, we would look to do more neighborhood paven, pavement preservation projects and try to expand the footprint of what we're accomplishing. And I will remind everybody that next year uh, with the the, S, the STIP, the State Transportation Improvement Program funds coming to the city after more than a decade of them being promised, we are going to see the paving work we've been talking about for a long time on 14th Street, on Coster Street, uh, Hawthorne, Felt, and Highland. So those are streets that all get a lot of complaints, and we are going to see some action next year on them. So Brian, is, I mean, Director Gerving, is it 14th Street? on the west side, right? Not on the east side. It's 14th from Broadway to west. So the, the portion that's funded by STIP is not the whole thing, but what we're looking to do is combine our other uh, gas tax and RMRA monies with the STIP money. And so we'll see a rehab of 14th all the way from Broadway uh, to west. And this is one where, because we knew this project was coming several years out, we were able to get in front of it and plan with PG&E well in advance for their uh, gas line rehab work. You see that in the process now on 14th and the pavement marked up all over the place for the work that they're going to be undertaking. So they'll get that work done and then next year we'll come in and pave and they won't be tearing up a brand new street. Well, it's nice to see we're working on some of that deferred maintenance. Thank you. Council Member Castellano. Thank you. Um, will it be possible to get um, kind of regular reports back to council and to the public with how the money's being spent? Um, what kinds of, you know, so I, you know, basically just getting at, I would like for the public to see sort of a clear record and presentation of the improvements and benefits that are happening with the tax. Will that be part of the mes messaging? Certainly for that additional portion of the money that's dedicated to street maintenance, yes, we would be able to do that. When you're talking about um, the rest of the general fund, uh, it becomes a little more difficult. But what we're seeing, and, and the city manager, or Director Millar can chime in if, if they want to add, but basically, like I said, we know that one cent of this tax is what we need just to maintain existing services and that's existing services at the reduced level that we've seen with this budget adoption, which has some significant reductions. So we're, we don't think that there's a high likelihood of um, seeing new services from this funding uh, beyond what we're already providing, except in the area of street maintenance. Okay, do we have any other questions? I think we might have some public comment on this item. Uh, City Clerk Powell? Uh, yes. 
We do. They all of uh, the folks have who have, will be commenting on this item are um, part of the Zoom call. And um, if you would like me to call them, I can see them in alphabetical order. If that would be helpful to you, Mayor. That would be very helpful to me. Thank you. Alrighty. So I'm going to go to the list and uh, we can begin. Sorry. Of course, just as I said that now there, it is. For those of you who are waiting to be called on, thank you also for participating. Uh, like I said earlier, it really matters and makes a difference to hear from the public. So we appreciate it. So, hang on. And my list is okay. I apologize. So the um, I will go ahead and just call for um, as I know them and as I see them. The alpha list is not coming up as I had hoped. So um, Caroline Griffith, and then I can unmute everyone too. So go Hi. ahead, Ms. Griffith. There we go. Hi. It's Caroline Griffith, resident of Eureka. Um, I was not one of the lucky people who got to take the survey about this tax, uh, but as Director Gerving was showing that particular slide with people's responses, uh, I agreed with every single one. I'm very pleased with the way that the direction the city's going. I'm ecstatic with the response you've made to this unprecedented pandemic, and I very much support this tax and appreciate you bringing it forward, uh, especially in the very well thought out way that you did. It was very, I, I mean, I pay attention to what's going on in the city. And like I said, I appreciate the direction you're going, but to be able to see line by line, all of the different services that are provided with our tax dollars uh, was really great. And when Director Gerving said that we would have 10 times as much money in the street budget as a cyclist who encounters treacherous holes sometimes, I was absolutely ecstatic. Um, so I really, Thank you for bringing this forward. I hope that the council does vote to put this on the ballot uh, because I look forward to being able to vote for it. And I think that um, like the very thoughtful way that you laid it out that we really would not be, this is to maintain our services that we have now and to bump it up a little bit. And I think that that's very important and I appreciate the way that you laid that out. So thank you very much, council. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker will be uh, Bill Prescott. Oh, um, mute him, please. Hi, uh, this is Bill Prescott, a uh, resident of Eureka. I'm the current chairperson of the Eureka Economic Development Commission. Uh, though the commission's unfortunately been suspended for the time being, looking forward to the commission coming back into uh, action. I'm also the general manager of Lost Coast Communications, uh, a local media company, and I hold a city of Eureka business license for my uh, private consulting firm, Prescott Designs. Um, the proposed one and a quarter sales tax measure is essential to keep our city financially solvent. Uh, various commitments by the city, or various commitments the city has made to both its citizens and its employees must be kept. I strongly recommend uh, educational outreach to the community to explain the dire sales tax situation. Even before COVID, uh, we know the city was running on a deficit. So uh, as a local business person, I am strongly in favor of this important sales tax measure. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Prescott. Our next speaker will be Mr. Neil Patel. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Eureka Hotelier, I support this agenda item. Um, while a sales tax increase will increase our cost of supplies and equipment purchases, I think that the ability to fix our roads Improves, improve our parks and waterfront area will ultimately help local businesses by providing a better experience for our tourists traveling to the area and hopefully increase future room night stays so that you know the city can get even more future tax revenue. And hopefully this will continue to fund economic development, which has had made great strides over the last few years. So again, I, I support this agenda item, even the, as a local business that will incur higher costs from this, but I do see the necessity of fixing our roads and 
increasing our um, that budget by over 10 times. So I think it'll be helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Scott Bauer. Oops, you unmuted and muted again. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened. There we go. Are we on it now? Yeah, yeah. we're good. Hey, thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Bauer. I live in the fourth ward. Um, my family and I strongly support this proposed measure as a uh, the great presentation that Director Gerving gave, you know, um, there is a great need to fund essential services. Anybody that drives our roads knows we need some we need some work done out there. Um, and I just like to point out for for all of us, you know, it doesn't seem like there's any help coming from the federal or, or state government. Budgets are in disarray, and we have to take care of ourselves in the city. So. Um, Happy to help in any way to see this initiative get passed. And um, thank you for, for bringing it forward. Thank you. Um, Mayor, our speaker is Mr. Scott Pesch. Thanks, Pam. Um, Brian Gribben, great job on the presentation. And uh, really appreciate all the facts and all the line items that you presented to us. I guess the reason for my uh, calling is just as a community member, um, I've been recently involved with as a subcommittee member of the Eureka City Schools. Always, we had the nice drive that we put together for um, the bond measure that went on our property taxes to help improve our infrastructure and more specifically, Alby Stadium and all that infrastructure that's has failed. So we luckily got that passed. And I think this is in the same kind of category. Um, I guess my message is that I do support this, uh, this measure. I do support the uh, continued sales tax. And I think the real message is this infrastructure. I think what we face as communities is you barely have enough money to pay for your budget. And then all of a sudden you have these capital improvements that might surprise you. It's like getting a new roof on your home. You never really save for it until you need it. And even then you don't have the money for it. So all of a sudden our streets are in disarray. We need to bring those back and just support the general infrastructure, but truly appreciate what all of you are doing, all the council members, the mayor, and um, I'm behind you. Our family's behind you. We really appreciate what you're doing and we support this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor. Thanks for your work at the schools. Mayor, our next uh, speaker will be uh, Ms. Michelle McKeon. Hi, Michelle McKeegan. Uh, good evening, council and, and mayor. Um, I wanna say that I too support this. Uh, I, the, the loss of the Q funding is just gonna be devastating. And we have made such progress in recent years in this city and, and, and not just in the big ticket my items like streets and cops and, and fire, but in smaller areas and dealing with the homeless for sure, uh, but also job training for people who've had difficulty uh, knowing even how to apply for jobs, programs for kids that that um, that really need help and, and working on our parks, which is a wonderful resource for kids, um, and the zoo, which is a fabulous resource for uh, families and, and kids. Uh, so I, all, all of that means that we have a city that is um, safer and cleaner and more attractive than, than it has ever been. And, and um, the research is clear that that is the kind of city that increases uh, economic growth and economic vitality. So I do support this, thanks. Thank you. M Mayor, that is um, the number of speakers, that concludes the number of speakers that I have. Well, that was lovely. We should have these people back every meeting. You guys were <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Messner. I am. Um, I, I first of all just want to also echo what Mayor Seaman said. Thank you so much for speaking to us tonight and expressing um, your support and even previous concerns um, tonight 
for all of you who are on this call and on this Zoom call, but um, I wanted also to just say a special thank you to the finance um, committee. And we do hope that you can get back to work again soon too. So thank you for being on the call as well and for all the work that you have done to bring this um, to, to, that you've done actually over these years, but um, I'm going to attempt to make this recommendation <laughs> and go ahead and uh, I'll just read through it. So um, I believe, well, first I want to say, I believe this is actually a long time in coming and it is greatly needed. Our streets need it. Our COVID-19 recovery needs it. Our constituents need it. And I think it's, it's in a way doubling doubling our money by bringing in money from the outside. So I, I just think it's really important. So um, I will go ahead and wave reading, read by title only and introduce bill number 982-CS, an ordinance of the city of Eureka amending chapter 35 of the Eureka Municipal Code relating to a supplemental transactions and use tax to be administered by the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration and adopt a resolution of the city council calling and giving notice of the holding of a general municipal election to be held on Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020, for the submission to the voters of a ballot measure relating to a supplemental transaction and use tax extension and a resolution of the city council requesting the board of supervisors of the county of Humboldt to consolidate the general municipal election for a ballot measure to be held on Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020 with a statewide general election to be held on that date and a resolution of the city council setting priorities for filling written arguments regarding a city ballot measure and directing the city attorney to prepare an impartial analysis and a resolution of the city council provided, providing for the um, filing of rebuttal arguments for city measures submitted at municipal elections. <laughs> Do I have a yeah. second? <laughs> council member Castellano. Oh, and <laughs> I saw council member Castellano first, so. I'll second the motion. <laughs> you win. Do we, have any, do we have any discussion about that very lengthy motion? All right. I, I just had one thing. Uh -huh. um, I just want to thank staff also um, and echo that, that appreciation for putting this together and um, doing such thorough research. And um, that was a really uh, lovely and helpful presentation. And I look forward to um, helping with the community outreach for this. And I, um, I hope that others will do that too. Um, I'm ready to go talk to people at their doors. So let's and do this I thing. I was thinking maybe we can have little Zoom parties, little neighborhood parties where we could. Uh, oh, right. I'm not supposed to go to people's doors. I forgot. I, know. I was really <laughs> ready. I was ready to go knock on doors. So however we could get that message out. If you have people who want to talk to us, let us know. I also would like to clarify, a Council Member Messner, it's the, not the Finance Committee. It's the Economic Development Commission. Okay. That we serve on. And, and um, actually putting signs out would be helpful, I think, to the community members if you guys, I know, will have signs. And um, so that can be helpful because people do still drive to the city even if you can't knock on doors. So that is one way. <laughs> so we're all ready to uh, support this, I think. Well, let's see. Let's take a vote and see if we're all ready to support this. I guess I shouldn't speak until I know. Councilmember Castellano? Oh, just... Uh, Quick comment. I'm I am also uh, ready to support this, um, and you know, happy to and, and excited to sort of galvanize uh, support in the community. Um, and I I do think that one thing I'm hopeful about that for this is that it will allow us to continue some of the beautification and art efforts as well, and and keep having things like the mural festival grow. So. You know, I know that's like maybe a small part of this, but I do think that really kind of ties into the roads mes message is that, you know, this like taking care of basic infrastructure and also I think nourishing uh, the well being of, of our community. So I think that was part of the point uh, Ms. McKeegan was making as well. It's the big stuff, but it's also the little stuff. And sometimes that little stuff is what makes you really feel like this place is home. Um, Can I, I just add one note, Madam Mayor? Um, just, I, I don't want to take away from, from what you said, Councilmember Castellano, but I, I do want to note just 
um, if in, in case anyone's wondering um, whether we spend city dollars on the um, mural festival, it's actually all privately funded. So just so people, uh, you know, I realize there's a lot surrounding um, that ne the neighborhoods and a lot of beautification that can happen in our efforts as well. But um, just want, since that's right around the corner, I've been trying to share with people that it's all um, privately funded. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, sorry, I wasn't trying to say that we were funding the mural festival, but that we would have funds to support endeavors like that. And yeah, and I think I'm excited about it coming up too. <laughs> Great. All right, City Clerk Powell, can we have a vote, please? Yes, Councilmember Castellano. Aye. Councilmember Messner. Aye. Councilmember Arroyo. Aye. Councilmember Allison. Yes. Councilmember Bergell. Aye. Aye. Unanimous yes vote, motion carries. Excellent. And now we are going to move on to the next item on our agenda. I flipped my pages around, so I have to look. It is the reports and action items. And now we get to hear our city diversity plan update and I that would be Director Folger. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here to um, provide you with a quick update on um, the movement we've made since our last meeting towards um, starting our diversity plan. So if you'll recall last meeting, we kind of talked about some of the background work that had already been done over the last year and a half or so on um, instituting a diversity and inclusion plan at the city. Um, again, that was slated to go out at the beginning of 2020, but was tabled for financial reasons. Um, and of course, obviously with COVID, it was um, became all the more dire, uh, the financial, those financial reasons. But we're back um, looking at this as a critical piece of our uh, strategic plan moving forward. And um, with recent events across the nation, um, this uh, came back to the surface as a priority for the council. And at our last meeting, um, we, I received direction from council to pursue the diversity plan that had already been um, agreed upon and had been um, crafted with input from each council member um, already. So we're kind of back to the plan that we had originally agreed upon and I was uh, asked to do it with great dispatch. And so um, here we are making quick headway. Um, so to date, we've um, had several meetings uh, with uh, Fog Break, which is the diversity consultant group that was unanimously decided upon last year to lead the city's diversity and, inclu and inclusion effort. Um, we had a series of productive meetings with them uh, since the last meeting to discuss imp implementation steps, some of the initial steps, and it resulted in an update of our timelines and the phases of the program uh, I'll be providing that information to all you council members uh, um, here shortly uh, after the meeting by email. Um, so what we have now is a couple of meetings scheduled to begin the kickoff of our diversity and inclusion plan. As I stated at the pre previous meeting, it's primarily going to be information gathering in this first phase through a series of facilitated discussions, both with uh, high level um, leadership and um, stakeholders within the community uh, and uh, high level leadership here within the city of Eureka and um, a cross section of um, staff members and some community members for um, just gathering the stories from people who have um, had experiences with um, possibly racial bias or things they witnessed and just kind of these consultants are gonna be um, gathering a narrative of people that um, live in the community, work for the city, um, and work in the community as well. Um, that first meeting is scheduled for um, August 10th, Monday, August 10th, so coming right up here, and then another subsequent meeting this, the, the next day. Um, right now, what our, my office has been tasked with um, at the direction of the city manager and assistant city manager is to start gathering um, names of people or just tapping people who might be interested 
in participating in these groups, up to 15 individuals will be participating in these groups. Um, and so that's where we're at now. Uh, and um, the plan that we have, it lays out four phases that take place over the course of two years. Again, the first phase is going to be mostly information gathering that's going to include meetings, discussions, and a survey that they'll be rolling out, which they'll be delivering the results of all of this information. They'll com be compiling it into an initial report that they'll be sharing sometime in late September or early October. Um, at that time, at that report will contain details that we're going to fit into the overall plan. And you can look at what each phase of this plan, like what what the phases contain and it's, it's trainings um, and other meetings of that nature, but really the meat of these trainings and discussions is going to be developed during this information gathering phase and compiled in that report that we'll receive in September. Um, so right now we're about to begin embarking on this a journey that's going to last, you know, the commitment is for this two years um, with this plan and the four phases carry us through 2022. Um, and, so, and that's what we've been able to find uh, funding for. So that, that 50 grand is not just a one-off thing. It's going to last over several years. Um, but also what we're doing is um, establishing a program and embracing this emphasis upon diversity and inclusion that it's going to extend well beyond that two years. It's going to be something that's an ongoing commitment of the city, a movement we're trying to establish. It's been very clearly communicated to um, staff by council that that is the aim, that is the goal that we have setting out. And we're going to we're going to really define those goals and that vision that's going to carry us beyond the, the terms of this plan um, and uh, what the diversity consultants are going to be working with us on and make it our own that we can carry into the future for um, years and years to come and just become second nature to all of us here at the city of Eureka, um, that we value diversity, that we want to be inclusive. Um, and it's just an exciting time right now, so I'm pleased to share that with you. On um, our next council meeting on the 4th, I'll give another update just before we initiate these discussions. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to make sure that everyone was kept apprised of the movement that has been made. Uh, since our last meeting, what the plan is moving forward, and we're going to get started here very quickly. Um, with that, I will um, entertain any questions you may have and um, take any information that you may have for me back to our consultants and um, report back at the next meeting. Does anybody have any questions for Director Folger? Anybody have any comments? Uh, Mayor, we do have uh, someone from the public who would like to comment on this item. Oh, thank you. Okay. It's uh, a report, so that was why I didn't ask for public comment, but I'm happy yeah. to have it. So. Sorry. Okay. No, that's, I'm happy to have it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Jones? Yes. Uh, they're ready for your public comment, um, I'm gonna start the microphone here. Okay. okay, they're ready for you now. Go ahead, please. Oh, yes. Yes, thank you. And, um, thank you. Council, let me pause this. I wasn't able to get in on as early as I wanted to, and I apologize about that. And uh, thank you very much for letting me speak. I, once again, I want to thank everyone for this entire process and being mindful of the minority community. And uh, like I said before, when I was at the last meeting, I would just like to put myself forward to help in any way possible. I wasn't able to hear the whole explanation, which hopefully I can um, get more information next time, now that I know how to get into the board meeting this way. So I do apologize. Um, but as for the inclusion, um, how do you even are going to attempt to actually bring people into this program? So, uh, I, I, I'm assuming that's a question uh, for, for me to answer, but please, Mayor, um, 
we'll ask it as the council. So I would also like to know, how are you gonna do that? And then no. <laughs> um, so um, I take the question to mean how we're going to begin to engage um, uh, community stakeholders as well as uh, staff members. Um, again, initially that will be through a series of facilitated discussions. Um, the purpose of which initially is simply to gather information about individuals' experiences living and working in this community um, that they've had with this issue of diversity or you know, um, personal experiences they've had with adversity um, in the community. Uh, and we're gonna get a broad cross-section of different individuals because diversity encompasses quite a, a lot of different um, things, demographic, um, racially, um, uh, ability-wise. So we're, we're going to try to um, create a broader narrative and, and, not, and take into account all of the various um, differences that people have to begin with. So again, it's going to be discussions that are going to be held in smaller groups, large groups. We're going to have community outreach programs. There will be community engagement and education programs. These are all um, part of the phases of the plan that we had. It was part of the plan we had before. They are still part of the plan now. They're a little bit more built out because we've been able to share more information with our consultants. But that's going to come, um, that, that's going to be something that will provide us with guidance on. We will we'll have meeting spaces. They're going to do um, surveys of the community and surveys of staff. So we'll be just connecting with people who show an interest, first of all, such as our, um, our public commenter. Um, he's already offered himself up to be a part of this process. I imagine we'll be speaking with them. Others are encouraged to do so as well. Please let us know what your, in your interests are here. The more information that we can gather during this first phase, the more comprehensive our efforts will be in the subsequent phases. Um, and help craft what this looks like. This is an interpretive process. Please help us decide what this is going to look like, who we're going to bring in, who is going to be a community stakeholder. There's more community stakeholders out there than I can think of right now, but you need to announce who you are. <laughs> um, and again, we're in the beginning stages right now. And so um, we will have more to talk about specifically as to how we reach out and when these meetings will be, what they'll look like, I imagine after we've had a chance to kind of talk with the, the consultants more um, uh, and have these meetings, so. Um, and I have one more question, um, real quick. Are your consultants local? The consultants are based out of the Bay Area, but we are exploring um, local partnerships as well as we um, craft an overall plan for the city. I think it's, it's been uh, communicated to me and, and it's been communicated through me to the consultants that the desire is to have a local, um, have some local um, ownership of this as well, um, not just at the city, but someone who can be a part of the facilitation process. So, Mr. Jones, I'm sorry, I um, didn't realize you were still on the phone. We have a three minute comment and it's not necessarily a discussion usually. Okay. Um, so questions usually would generally come from the council. Um, but thank you so much for participating and uh, and please continue to do that. And, and I will, and thank you once again. I, I appreciate your time and energy that y'all are putting towards this. Thank you again. And I'll thank get off the Oh no, you're doing great, thanks. Councilmember Royo. Yeah, I wanted to echo the thanks and appreciation for, um, I know it's not always easy to figure out our different meeting formats and we've had to change it around a little bit. So thank you for, for calling in. Um, and um, I do wanna suggest that we do include Mr. Jones, um, obviously a community member who's following this issue and um, has expressed interest um, in participating um, and I also, you know, I know it's right around the corner and we want to ensure that of the small group that meets that we do hear from quite a few different voices. Um, 
And I guess I'd, I'd just like to suggest that we invite um, people who identify as people of color to kind of step forward and come to the front or that we nominate folks who have reached out to us already um, and had an interest in working together to improve you know, outcomes for their communities um, here in Eureka. So I don't know if staff would like to hear like recommendations or whether you already have a list of people in mind. Um, but I think Mr. Jones's question about how we're gonna ensure inclusion in this kind of step of the process since this, these conversations are gonna frame what we do next. Um, I, I think that's a great question. So um, if staff could elaborate a little more on, would you like us to be involved or do you already have a list of folks that you're planning to reach out to? Um, what might that look like? So um, since this, these first meetings are fairly close, um, just a few weeks away, um, and based on the advice of our uh, consultants, we've, we've already put together a list of, of who we felt might have been appropriate individuals to invite to the initial meetings. These are by no means the only meetings that we will be having on this subject. Um, it's going to be a very meeting heavy plan and there will be a lot of opportunity for individuals to get involved. Um, and this, obviously the sooner we know who's interested, the better. Um, with that, I, I, of course, I'm um, open to um, taking suggestions from council um, and us uh, incorporating those suggestions into the overall plan. For this upcoming meeting, certainly we can um, still take suggestions, but we have done some work to identify individuals that we can get at short notice and bring into the conversation. Um, hopefully that answers your question. That does, thank you. Yeah, um, I just, uh, I know that we have pushed you to act quickly. Um, and I also wanna be sure that um, as we move forward, people feel like they know what's going on and they know how they might weigh in. Um, and I particularly want to hear from people whose experiences are not my experiences. Um, so <laughs> thank you for moving quickly on it. And um, I, I trust that staff are thinking thoughtfully and critically about this. Um, just, um, I guess, let us know if you would like help um, and I'll, I'll send you a couple of suggestions, but I would say um, that, you know, um, Mr. Jones is obviously like really following this issue and volunteering himself. Um, the folks that I'm thinking of are folks who represent um, different parts of our community who are often not represented at our meetings, um, but haven't been like uh, overtly saying like, pick me to be on your committee. Um, it's just that more folks who come to mind as, as involved in the community city residents who um, I think could could add some perspective. So I'll, I'll send you a couple of um, ideas, but it's, it's not something that I, uh, I feel I need to insert myself on. Um, I see Council Member Castellano wants to say something too, but I wanted to add really quickly about Mr. Jones, because I he's talked to me a, a couple of times. And what I love is that he's very new to this process which is really confusing. I mean, sometimes I'm still learning about it too. Um, and I think that to really reach people who are not um, really engaged, it is a win for us. So anytime we can find somebody who maybe is nervous or a little bit skeptical, but willing to try it out, um, it's, just such a nice, refreshing voice to hear uh, people who are just willing to take those baby steps into the process and uh, looking for them. Council Member Castellano. Um, thank you, Director Folger for the report. And um, I'm definitely excited um, to see this, you know, that you've really been moving this forward. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, I do think that, um, and I'll, I'll send you a couple people. Um, one thing that, that I would like to make sure we consider is just how we convey invitations, you know, to participate because a lot of times, um, you know, like we may not know people who would be really valuable participants or, you know, and so I think, 
um, ask, you know, creating different press releases to ask groups that support people of color um, to send out and also um, using different kinds of media, you know, like some people, you know, like the radio is more accessible to some people than, than you know, television or, you know, or, or things like that. Um, so that's, you know, as, as we move forward and have more public meetings, um, I definitely want to make sure that um, we're looking for and considering ways of reaching people, you know, I mean, and maybe even like I know, um, you know, in my local community, a lot of people use the small grocery stores, right? You know, so maybe having some flyers um, at some of the small like neighborhood grocery stores and things or things like that could be ways of uh, reaching people who might not um, access other kinds of media. Uh, certainly. Uh, what, when we get to the steps where we're going to be doing that sort of very forward-facing community engagement, town hall meeting type of uh, communications, we're going to try to solicit interest in participating, um, solicit interest from the community to participate in that. Um, and we'll use whatever means we can to get the word out um, tactfully and uh, with uh, you know, an inclusive mind. And so um, right now we're, we're starting with somewhat of a smaller core groups and it's going to build out from there. Um, and I believe that will come primarily in the uh, uh, later stages of, of phase one um, and um, going into phase two. Again, um, I will be sharing those uh, updated phases and proposal with you. Um, uh, this morning or this evening via um, email. Any other comments, Councilmember Messner? Yeah, I really appreciate all the work you guys have done. I know it's um, difficult to, especially looking at the budget and what we were what we were asking um, for you to to make sure happened and do it quickly. So I just appreciate everything that you have done. Um, and I know there was a lot of work well before this over the last few years, but especially in the last year. Or so thank you for that. And um, I also will send you some names, um, but I, I completely agree with what um, Councilmember Castellano was saying, how important it is that we reach out in a diverse way, like to uh, kind of cross, cross um, communications, it's really important. So um, as much as we can be thinking that way in, in those second phases or the end of your first phase or how, wherever we start hitting that, um, that's going to be really important. And um, that's been, there's actually quite a few people that at a very short notice, I was able to get onto a panel um, within really five days. So I do know that there's people within our community that, and it was fantastic and fabulous and that'll be um, public pretty soon because it's getting edited right now, but um, for this discussion and for the importance of this. So um, I def you know, we definitely have members of our community that want to be engaged with this, but they are perhaps maybe don't know how either or even what's happening. So. I'll definitely forward you some names and um, and as it sounds like some of our other council members as well. So thank you so much for all the work you're doing on this and really appreciate staff and and the um, really the creativity that you guys have been able to come up with some funding as well. So thank you for working so hard on that. All right. Is that all? We can move on now to the city manager report. City manager Slattery, welcome back to the front seat. Good evening once again, Mayor and Council. Um, just uh, not much. I wanted to give a quick uh, COVID update. Um, um, after the recent, um, you know, they opened, they did the opening, and then they 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 closed down our restaurants again. I just want to. Thank our staff and public works and community services that have looked for outside of the box ways of helping out some of the restaurants who um, 
no longer have the ability to dine in. So we had already started a process prior to um, uh, the restaurants actually opening to allow for um, the um, free use of our sidewalks through an encroachment permit process, but free of charge. And we have recently expanded that to our boardwalk um, along the waterfront, as well as all of our public uh, parking lots. So if there's any restaurants out there that are adjacent to a public parking lot, please contact our engineering department at 441-4194. And there are free encroachment permits available to lease some of those spots um, from us so that you can still have dining at your restaurants. Then I also wanted to give an update on the um, grant program that our housing and finance departments have put together. Um, we've been getting a lot of um, feedback and um, requests for information related to that. We've done our best to try and get that information out there. Um, some of the programs that are out there that are offering grant funds to individuals that are um, affected by either employment or their, their rental, um, because of the pandemic, they have been requiring um, a, a lot of onerous information. I just want to get it out there that we simply just need the employment information demonstrating that you had a reduction in hours or that you have lost your employment through this pandemic and we can get grant funding to you. There was $200,000 of grant funding for individuals available. At the last um, meeting, um, our housing specialist, uh, Kristen Raymond, reported that there was $50,000 of that used up. I'm sure there's been some more, but we still have a lot of funding available for those that are in need. And we also still have some funding available for those nonprofits that provide uh, shelter services and homeless services. And so um, if, if people are interested, please get a hold of our housing technician and we can help them out with that. And then the final note I wanted to go is that uh, uh, we have a member of our city family who is um, in the ICU. Uh, he's a maintenance worker in our public works. It's Jim Hale. He is the uh, 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 union chief for ECAA. And uh, he is um, in ICU right now. So I'm just hoping that we can all keep him in our thoughts and uh, hope that he gets better. And that's all I have. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that, but uh, thank you for thinking of him. Um, so we will, does anybody have questions for Miles? Do you want to move on to council reports? We'll start with uh, council member Bergel since you're right there next to city manager. Well, I just, I didn't really have a report. I just want to say thank you to our community and people that are wearing their masks in public and washing their hands and being responsible. I much appreciate you. And um, I know that this is really challenging. As many of you know, I'm kind of like a hugger and I'm a toucher and that kind of thing. And it's been really hard. And I'm sure that some of you are feeling that as well. Um, there are resources out there. So, you know, you don't have to do this alone. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Castellano. Let's see. Um, staying busy. I've been involved with um, Eureka Main Street and some meetings associated with that. Um, continuing to volunteer um, or attend meetings for the COVID Economic Resilience Consortium and volunteer at St. Vincent de Paul Free Meal. Um, participating in the calls for people experiencing homelessness, um, attending meetings for the Redwood Region Economic Development Commission Executive Committee, <laughs> uh, meeting with local environmental groups, uh, and participating in a broadband advocate, advocacy working group. Um, so that's kind of the different things I've been uh, participating in. Um, definitely, um, I am, and I know some council members uh, spoke to this last meeting um, or a recent meeting. I am meeting with people via Zoom or phone calls or walks. So if you want to reach me, um, please send me an email and, and I'm happy to converse on the issues that are important to you. Um, Thanks. Council Member Messner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a lot of things <laughs> happening, but um, 
I mentioned that racial restoration panel that um, we did was really an amazing thing and that's gonna be um, coming out pretty soon. So look for that, um, that discussion and what that, what just is happening within our community and what people's experiences are. And um, big thank you to our own chief for participating in that. So I really appreciate Chief Watson for his participation in that panel. Um, and also the Eureka corridor, um, the Broadway corridor and the multimodal modal transportation um, that's in process right now and discussion and um, really looking forward to some of those concepts coming forward to the public as well. So that is going to be coming soon. Um, they're really working through those right now and there are some exciting opportunities um, and possibilities for future transportation around our community in and in particularly in that area and uh, beautification which we all would like so um, also wanted to uh, thank interim city manager um, slattery for his work and his team's work i think kristen uh, planner senior planner kristen gets helped put together um, a presentation that we both um, interim manager Slattery and I put, did for the Coastal Commissioners um, on Friday, which was a really important piece. Um, and really it was uh, quite a, an important meeting for, um, for us to be able to have with the commissioners. And in regard to our, our local coastal plan with sea level rise and some of the plans um, that we have for that and how to address those. So I really appreciate all the work that was done on that. And they were, um, they were very thankful. And every time we get in front of the coastal commissioners, um, every time I've been in front of them over the last two years since I've been on this committee at the state level, um, it's been, really, um, really good to see changes happening and better communication and better bridging with the coastal cities as well as the commissioners. So um, very, very important work. So thank you very much, <laughs> Director Slattery and your team as well. So um, I think, oh, there's one other thing and that is that there is a blood drive happening for EPD. EPD is doing a big blood drive. It's it's, um, I guess it's, there's quite a few different entities. <laughs> They're having a competition, but we would love to see um, our, our um, people come out and give blood. It's really important right now. This, it's happening all week, but tomorrow's the big day. Um, and so, they're really in need of blood. People aren't giving the same way as it has been in the past and usually is because of COVID. So um, please come out and participate in the blood drive. Um, it's important for all of our community. So, cause COVID isn't the only thing that people are dealing with physically, even as Director Slattery, Director Slattery mentioned earlier. So thank you so much to everyone who um, will participate in that. Council Member Arroyo. Um, I'm, I have very little to report beyond the kind of usual stuff that I do for the council, um, participating in board meetings and such. Um, I do, um, want to recognize, uh, that we'll be participating in Coast Guard Month a little differently this year. Um, obviously there won't be so many events that are in-person events, um, but it is going to be the 20th anniversary of us being a Coast Guard city, which is really exciting. So um, there, it's going to be kind of a smaller Coast Guard month, but we'll certainly be recognizing it at our August 4th meeting, um, which is also Coast Guard Day. It's the Coast Guard's birthday um, in 1790, but you know, close enough. Um, and um, I've been enjoying helping out with it, um, both with my city hat on and my Coast Guard hat on. So I'm um, looking forward to that. And I encourage folks to just um, think of Coastie, share a story that's positive about the Coast Guard, um, share a great story about um, 
you know, Eureka being a Coast Guard city um, with your friends or family or on social media or however you feel moved to. Um, but it's, it is a really cool thing that we're able to maintain this um, Coast Guard city status and there's not very many in the country. So um, it's pretty neat. Um, that's all I wanted to make an announcement about. Thank you, Council Member Arroyo. And uh, thank you for being so active in Coast Guard days this year. It's, um, it is a big year. We were, we're not only a select few, but we were the second ever, I believe, to become a Coast Guard city. So it means a whole lot to us. And, um, and so we're looking forward to a smaller, but still heartfelt Coast Guard days coming up in August. And with that, I believe we can adjourn the meeting. Thanks all. Thanks everyone, good night.